Good evening and welcome to another webinar of the America Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation. My name is Joana Gomes-Bero and I'll be moderating today's discussion on the EU-US Trade and Technology Council. Before we begin, just a few words about the Chair. The America Europe Chair on Technology, Innovation and International Regulation is a recent interdisciplinary initiative of the America Europe Fund. And as a convening chair, it aims to bring together expertise at KU Leuven in order to track, examine, and compare regulatory developments relating to technology and innovation in America and in Europe. And on top of that, the chair also promotes opportunities for cooperation and learning between policymakers, business communities, civil society actors, and knowledge institutes on both sides of the Atlantic. Today, we are fortunate to have Mr. Martin Chepensky and Professor Kenneth Propp to discuss the EU-US Trade and Technology Council. Um, the Trade and Technology Council was launched in June 2021 by Commission President von der Leyen and US President Biden to deepen transatlantic cooperation and coordinate approaches to address key trade and technology issues. The TTC met for the first time in September 2021, again in May 2022, and just held its third ministerial meeting uh, last week outside Washington. The uh, public was watching closely and both the European Commission and the US government were looking to present concrete results in this meeting, but were facing some uh, important difficulties, namely the growing divergence over the US's uh, Inflation Reduction Act, as well as the EU's uh, Artificial Intelligence Act and the US, US's uh, CHIPS Act. Joining us today to discuss uh, the outcome of this meeting is Mr. Martin Chepanski, who is a policy analyst in the European Parliament Research Service. Specifically, Martin works in the uh, External Policies Unit of the Members Research Service. And also joining us today is Professor Kenneth Kopp, who teaches European Union Law at Georgetown University uh, Law Center and serves as a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's uh, Europe Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, before uh, going ahead and starting the discussion, I'd just like to let our audience know that they can ask uh, questions for our speakers using the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen, and we will uh, address these questions at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, for now, I'd like to thank both of our speakers for joining us today and kick off the discussion. Uh, as I have mentioned, this third ministerial meeting was highly anticipated and closely watched uh, by the public. So why was this meeting so important for both uh, the EU and the US? Um, Kenneth, would you like to go first and tell us your perspective on this? Sure, um, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with, um, with your audience today. Uh, hello from Washington. Um, it's been a, a bit over a year since the CTC launched, as, as you've just noted. And um, the, the first meeting, was primarily organizational, uh, setting up this elaborate architecture of working groups and periodic meetings at senior political levels, um, setting out the, the, the ambitions. Um, the, the second meeting then uh, was uh, dominated by the Ukraine invasion and, and was largely focused on a common US and European uh, reaction to that. So now here we are um, a year later and um, people were really looking to see if the group was actually gonna make uh, specific progress on the, the broader trade and technology agenda. And, and I think there were um, a few achievements uh, which we'll talk about in more detail, I'm sure, in the area of digital infrastructure development, artificial intelligence, and uh, semiconductor supply chains, to, to, to name a few. You know, I think we have to keep in mind that the Trade and Technology Council was designed in a way as the antidote to the failed uh, trade negotiation between the US and the European Union, the, the Trade and Technology Investment Partnership. The idea was that it would make incremental progress in discrete areas. It was never intended as a, as a grand uh, trade bargain. And it was consciously set up to focus on particular areas where uh, legislation was not fixed in stone, uh, particularly uh, digital and, and climate. Um, so 
within the parameters of those ambitions, I think there, there have been some achievements, but it, it also has to be said that there are a lot of questions that, that remain about the exercise. It's not dealing with the major trade irritants, um, primarily the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and um, equally from, from the perspective of many in the United States, it's not dealing with some of the, um, the major EU digital legislation where uh, there's a perception that there are protectionist elements at play. And, and as a result, there is um, a level of frustration that has grown uh, particularly in, in the business community, which has not been very closely consulted in this exercise so far. Um, well, it's uh, since, uh, as Kenneth said, the uh, TTC is uh, always surrounded by some dramatic circumstances like this, uh, this, this war. And then since, uh, since the uh, meeting um, in, in Paris Sacre, um, it, it's become even more, um, let's say, dramatic with, with, with the tensions around the Inflation Reduction Act. And generally, the problems of inflation have really really been um, very prominent also over the last few months so that, that that's uh, also part of the same story and the, the war continuation and the, the worsening global economic outlook these are all the um, items that we need to discuss together uh, the EU and the US uh, take into account our, our very um, very dense economic and political ties um, as can I say I think the first meeting was really um, launching inauguration agenda setting then and there was a, a meeting in Paris when they were talking about uh, framework and then how to get to uh, to deliver the results. And now in Maryland, uh, the third meeting was supposed to, to be all about concrete, uh, tangible results, uh, which also has been uh, questioned uh, by observers and and, and, and and the think tank community and so on. Um, I would also say, uh, um, that uh, yeah, 14 months have passed and, 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 and let's say this narrative is not really materialized in my opinion, that, that we have moved decided, decided, decided in a decisive way to, to the delivery phase yet, yeah? because there is a lot of talk about uh, agreeing to discuss things on supply chains, for example. Uh, so still to, to a certain extent it's normal because TTC is, 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 is a living creature, it is, it, it is not, um, a theoretical um, concept, so it is it is um, uh, rooted in reality, so it is affected by by the developments. But to a certain extent, also adding more things and agreeing to talk, uh, um, also let's say indicate that it's still in, 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 in somehow in a conceptual phase a lot. It's it's not decisively moving to the delivery to, for me. Mm -hmm. And you've you've already mentioned the. A sort of hot topic of the moment, which is, of course, the, the Infl Inflation Reduction Act, which the EU claims um, to be discriminatory since it provides uh, tax incentives for uh, green technologies uh, made in the US. In, the, in particular, the EU fears that this legislation might actually cause industries like electric car manufacturing to move to the US. So how is this dispute evolving and what's the role of the TTC uh, in all of this? Martin, would you like to go uh, ahead first this time? Uh, yes, um, I would say, you know, previous TTC, uh, talking about electric vehicles, that there was an agreement to work some standards for charging infrastructure and so on. And since then, the, the Inflation Reduction Act has shifted to the attention in, in automotive to, to subsidies. But of course, it's not only the, the, the electric vehicles, but the, the very big element is, is subsidizing the renewables and green energy projects. Uh, so um, it's somehow an unfortunate moment for, for Europe to be facing massive subsidies in this, since uh, we have uh, high energy prices uh, here, much higher than in, than in the US. So this has caused a lot of anxiety and a lot of, maybe that's why uh, it's responsible. So it's, it's a kind of a structural problem due to the fact that we have the war, that we are decoupling from Russian energy sources, but it definitely casts a long shadow on the TTC and the discussion about the, the inflation reduction. Um, the, the green transition component in the IRA is something like $350 billion, so it's it's very big. It's like 2% of EU GDP, or taking into, German, into account German GDP, it's 8%, so it's a huge amount. So 
I've heard a lot of comments that from your perspective, it's a, it's a threat to competitiveness. Um, but to some extent, this meeting has de-escalated the situation, at least temporarily. The visit of President Macron just before, and uh, let's say uh, President Biden talking about tweaking the IRA. Um, I'm not sure. There is no really concrete yet, uh, concrete way uh, how to tweak it. So that, for example, it can include EU companies. I've, I've read different things. Like uh, there is an exception for the countries that that have FTA with the US, but which we don't. But we have a we are party to govern procurement agreement. So maybe this way. So, but uh, it, it is all really um, speculation now. And 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 I, um, one thing is for sure that that that, that the de-escalation happened, and there's been a task force established outside of the TTC to discuss this in more detail. Kenneth, uh, what's the outlook in the US regarding the Inflation Reduction Act? Is there now um, a bigger understanding of the EU's concerns, especially after this, this last meeting? Well, Marcin has, has hit most of the main points here. Um, the, the, the topic absolutely dominated the, the run-up to, to the meeting in Washington, and that had partly to do with um, the unusual timing of um, the French president's uh, state visit here uh, just a few days before, uh, before the EU meeting. Um, president von der Leyen gave a speech in Bruges in which she suggested ways in which the EU might respond to, to the Investment Reduction Act. Um, so that was, that was really the setup uh, for the event. And, and um, uh, President Biden indeed did lower the tension over the issue a little bit in his press conference with, with Macron, where, where he mentioned um, vaguely the possibility of some adjustments. Um, that uh, almost certainly would not be legislative adjustments. Uh, but rather uh, possibly some steps which can be taken um, within the U.S. Uh, executive branch. And as Marcin has mentioned, um, there is a waiver authority um, that, that might be used. It wasn't really intended for this situation, but um, there is creative thinking going on. And uh, there has been a, a dedicated working group set up now, interestingly, the, the working group is, is not within the TTC itself. It is, it is between um, senior officials in von der Leyen's cabinet and, and uh, senior officials in the U.S. National Security Council. And that's, that's revealing. Um, so what happened at the, at the TTC on this subject? Well, clearly there was some discussion um, uh, among the ministers um, uh, who were here. Um, there is a reference to it in, in the joint statement, um, pretty, pretty thin and mild, uh, simply noting that there had been some preliminary progress that, that, they, had, um, that they had taken stock of. So uh, again, we have this, this um, um, situation where we have parallel tracks proceeding. One is uh, sort of the, the concrete um, progress that both sides aim for through the TCC. And then the second is, is the much more politicized discussions um, over uh, the particular trade or attempt at the moment. Mm -hmm. the, um, another topic that's also on uh, many people's minds is of course microchips. And in this, uh, in this meeting, in, in the statement, it is it's clear that the US Department of uh, Commerce and the European Commission will set up uh, an early warning mechanisms for disruptions of the microchip uh, supply chain. And on top of this, the parties also agreed to share information on, on ship subsidies in order to avoid a subsidy raise. So can we see these mechanisms as a step forward in terms of uh, addressing the vulnerability of the global supply chain and as well as uh, avoid a, a subsidy raise? And how do these mechanisms that will now be implemented actually relate to the US's CHIP Act and the draft EU CHIP Act? Uh, Marjorie, Kenneth, who? Um, sure, I can. I, I can start on that. Um, 
the the written administrative arrangement between the Commerce Department and the Commission um, on early warnings of disruptions in the supply chain for chips is is certainly a a, a useful framework for uh, for cooperation. It remains to be seen um, how it will be utilized in practice, um, and uh, you know it's an example of how the two sides, I think, can make progress in areas where their where their interests are aligned, and avoiding supply chain disruptions is is certainly one of them. Um, the 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 legislation uh, there is essentially parallel legislation on both sides. The U.S. has already enacted a rather large uh, subsidy measure for for chips manufacturing uh, and and the EU legislative process is not quite as far along, but their legislation is also coming uh, towards towards completion. Um, you know, there is language in in the joint statement about avoiding subsidy races and and market distortions. Um, my 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 personal view is that that may turn out to be wishful thinking. Um, both sides seem set on their courses of, of um, spending large sums of money to, to attract uh, chips manufacture. And uh, the idea that, that through essentially expert level discussions, one can uh, deconflict um, these, these two policies may be, may be too large a task for, uh, for the TTC. I don't know, Marcin, what, what do you think? I, I agree that it's a good, definitely a good start uh, to to address the, the, the supply chain problems, as we had the the, 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 the problems because the, the supply and demand did not match, and and and, and you know the the chips that were were not were needed during the teleworking and working from home and were were different than the chips that needed to be used for cars. And uh, when the cars uh, demand uh, first, they plummeted and skyrocketed. Uh, this created like a real uh, structural shift. And then, and, and, and the nature of, of, of semiconductor production is such that it's not easy to switch between the types and 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 to increase capacity in general. So I think knowing more uh, from the industry and, and having this early warning mechanism, it's it's it's, it's very useful. But uh, um, I would like to also have uh, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, for example, uh, who are also big players to to be on board, to, to have really a full picture here and as well with global crisis. Uh, concerning subsidies, I think there's a, a move towards uh, this subsidized industrial policy which is evident over the, in, in the recent time. And like, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's going to be, it, it's about the conflicting these, <laughs> these policies really. Um, so you need to start somewhere. I think transparency is good to, to know what the other side is, is doing. However, yes, if you really want to go full on to create a domestic uh, semiconductor industry, how relevant, I mean, would you really look at, 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 at the TTC at that point? I, I also have my doubts. What will be really the heft of this to, to limit the subsidies or from from what I understand, that is is that these are these two um, acts. They they look for complementarity, so there is not so much tension as with the elect electric vehicles. Um, and uh, uh, talking more about the EU Chips Act, there is also a potential for, for future disagreements because uh, there's a third pillar which which deals with the monitoring and crisis response to the to the shortages. There is a emergency powers proposed by the Commission. Uh, uh, to address the, 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 the sudden disruptions and they would allow to uh, impose priority orders on private chip makers, including the American ones, and use export controls to, to prevent the technology from, from leaving the EU. So this is still, of course, uh, in the discussion, uh, but, but uh, uh, yeah, there's some potential as always for frictions in the future. Indeed, and uh, the and you've you've also already mentioned that the TTC, of course, uh, also presented uh, several outcomes in terms of cooperation on on emerging technologies, and one of those outcomes is a joint roadmap to develop common tools and standards for trustworthy uh, artificial intelligence. So I've I, I've wanted to ask you maybe start 
starting with uh, Marcin, um, what is this uh, AI roadmap that the parties just agreed on and what effects can we expect to have both on the party's uh, internal policies with, of course, uh, they use um, Artificial Intelligence Act going through the legislative procedures, as well as can we expect this roadmap to have effects on the party's collaboration in international standard bodies? Um, <clears throat> as this, there are very different views on the AI and globally, I think this, this roadmap, it, 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 it seeks to find the common ways for the UN US to, to define and evaluate artificial intelligence using the same methodology it's uh, it's focused on getting the eu and us on the same page but it's also focused a lot on the technical side and setting the global standards it does not mention china explicitly but of course this uh, elephant in the room always like somewhere when you talk about global stand technical standards um i think also what uh, uh, th this is an attempt to to have a common position to to have some leadership in setting standards here and um what does the roadmap also do is sets up another working group, <laughs> which is uh, going to establish common definitions and the knowledge sharing mechanism to give advance warning of potential risk in, in, in AI and also some shared repository of metrics and methodology. So there's, there's a lot of, um, let's say, convergence working together. Um, what will it mean, for example, for the, I mean, it's, it's good that if, if we have a common position and, and, and and um, work closing together for the cooperation in international standard bodies because i mean if, if, if the only way to promote let's say the the human-centric liberal ai is is, uh, is first to work out the position between the eu and us then gather and take more partners on board and then go through the international bodies um also um about the domestic policies uh I have to be on. Honestly, we have to see when the EU AI uh, Act is adopted. Is if, if it is fully compatible and, and fully ticks all the boxes with the roadmap. Because it, it's uh, so far, I've not seen an um, analysis. You know that, that really took two texts, uh, particularly difficult as, as the AI Act is still in the legislative pipeline. Um, but yeah, we should see uh, how these two go together when 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 it is adopted finally. Kenneth, what's your what's your view on on this new roadmap? Well, I, first a, a, a general comment. Um, I think the the subject of artificial intelligence is is one that may um, be a real test of the uh, of the institution of the TCC itself, and and in a sense, proof of concept can. Can the two sides work together on useful ways on emerging technology issues? Um, because it's an area where uh, the legislative landscape is so far less developed, as as Marcin mentions, the EU is um, working through the legislation right now. Um, the U.S. Um, has not, by and large, taken a, a statutory approach to the subject. There's been some guidance that's come out at the executive level on how our federal regulatory agencies should address uh, AI issues. And so it's, it's at a formative stage still, um, although uh, evolving very fast, it, it has to be said, and, and the governments are, are scrambling to keep up. The roadmap itself, um, strikes me as as really uh, a, a useful way to to navigate here. Um, the idea is to develop a, sort of a common transatlantic vocabulary when it when it comes to key aspects of, of AI, for example, how you measure, how you assess risk. Um, there's work that's been done on this subject. Uh, in the OECD and other places, and they specifically say they're they're planning to to build on that. But several uh, expert working groups will will be established, and so um, as as they dig dig into the details, I think it it's an area where the communication between the two sides really could could be quite um, productive. Um, international standards bodies. Uh, 
will will remain a, a challenge here because uh, they are to a significant extent uh, private sector directed. Um, the the EU has begun to move to exert some more central control uh, over over them um, in response to um, sort of the very concerted efforts that that China, uh, for example, has made in in standards bodies um, lately. Um, and and you know the U.S. and the EU stress that they can uh, help develop those international standards on the basis of shared beliefs in human rights and democratic values. And that, of course, is, is, is a reference to, uh, to countries that, that don't necessarily uh, share those views. Um, you know, whether, whether the TTC will, in the end, um, allay the concerns in Washington about the Artificial Intelligence Act it's it's too soon to, to say. There are diplomatic uh, conversations going on about specific elements of of that legislation, and and I'm sure that will continue. But uh, one has to remember the the quite varying approaches uh, that are being taken in the U.S. and and in Europe to artificial intelligence legislation. The the EU approach is is kind of the classic. Comprehensive, top-down. Let's let's set a, a an overall framework for the development of this legislation. Uh, the the U.S. approach is is much more um, allowing the technology to develop, empowering regulatory agencies to address specific problems uh, as they come along. Um, that's that's a historic disparity. Uh, it's, it's a difference in the way the U.S. and, and the EU think about uh, about regulation, and I think that's going to continue to be an element here. Just just to give one um, uh, sort of prominent example, um, one of the key debates, as I understand it, in in the European Parliament about this about the AI Act has to do with uh, the use of facial recognition software uh, by law enforcement authorities, um, which um, may be considered high risk. It may be ruled out in, in certain circumstances. If you look at the, the closest thing the US has to a counterpart document, um, which is um, what's called a blueprint, uh, there is no mention of this subject at all. Um, in other words, the, the U.S. federal government is, is not proposing to, to regulate uh, facial recognition in law enforcement settings. That, that decision is instead left to the state levels and to local governments, which, of course, is uh, primarily where uh, police functions are, are located in, in the U.S. system. So that's a, that's a big difference right there. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've already uh, touched on this since, uh, of course, tensions with, with China are, are growing over um, in the country's economic policies, as well as China's attempt to shape international uh, technology standards. And in, in this meeting, the parties agreed on several points in terms of technology standards, and they also agreed um, to explore policy options to address what are called non-market economic policies and practices and address economic coercion. So do you think that with this meeting, the US and the EU are coming closer to having a common approach regarding China or, or are we still very far from, from that scenario? Can, Kenneth, what's your, what's your perspective on this coming from the, the US specifically? Well, as as we've already said, um, the the word China only appears a very few times in in the joint statement. Um, you know, I think there's a mention in relation to to common challenges that that uh, companies face in the medical uh, devices market in in China. Um, but um, if you if you look at some of the broader initiatives. I think there are some signs that um, common thinking is is developing uh, on China. 
Uh, one is uh, the announcement that was made that they would be coordinating, US and EU would be coordinating development finance for, for digital connectivity in a couple of parts of uh, the developing world um, in, in Jamaica and, and Kenya. And, and that is clearly a response to China's similar efforts uh, around the globe um, to, to proliferate um, its uh, technologies. Um, and, and similarly, I think the, the discussion about um, diversifying suppliers in, in ICT uh, supply chains uh, is, is similarly aimed at, at uh, concerns about, about China. And, and as we've already mentioned, the, the AI roadmap uh, itself with this very pointed reference to, to human rights um, is, is undoubtedly at least motivated in part by, by the Chinese drive to, to dominate that technology. Uh, Martin, do you also think that we are reaching a point of, of a common approach? I would say we are, we are inching towards a common approach, not, maybe not reaching the point of a uh, common approach. That's also, uh, also because in, in the EU, we also are not, it's also not easy to, to work out one, one position where member states vary uh, very much with their attitudes and relations with China. You will hear different things in Berlin and different things in Vilnius. Um, also, but having said all that, uh, I think there's a growing uh, understanding in Europe that, uh, uh, that this uh, kind of um, uh, autocracy in technological fields is something to, to, to be taken really seriously and, 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 and be, be distancing. Uh, and then we need some distancing in, in, in the, let's say, security related technology, AI, and so on. Um, so, um, with all that, the EU is, uh, supports uh, the multilateral rules based order, which is China as a member of the of the WTO. But but if you if you look at the TTC concretely, there's a lot of things that that uh, uh, even not explicitly, but have let's say have China written all over them, like the new two new connectivity projects with uh, Jamaica and Kenya, uh, which which is, it's not specifically mentioned, but these are definitely is alternative to the and road initiative. Uh, the, the dialogues on forced labor, the due diligence, the investment screening group. Um, uh, previous TTC had a communication on statement on security risks from high risk vendors, also the export controls. So um, yeah, this, 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 there's a lot uh, of, of, of nearing the position, let's say from both sides to me. And uh, maybe it would be interesting to see if and to what extent the EU will be involved in the export controls of, of semiconductors to China, uh, which is certainly uh, something talked about and we've heard of, of some pressure coming to be more involved, but uh, yeah, let, 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 let's see what happens there. Mm -hmm. And besides China, of course, DTC discussions have also been centered uh, around Russia and, and the DTC has actually played quite a, a key role so far in, in creating a unified France against Russia in the context of the war in, in Ukraine, and particularly by um, establishing a joint approach to uh, export controls. And in this uh, last meeting, the EU and the US further uh, agreed to cooperate on export controls of sensitive and emerging technologies. Our, Russia-related issues, um, the area where the TTC so far has been uh, more successful. From an outside perspective, it, it seems to be one of the areas where the parties more easily uh, agree with each other. I think it was maybe, the, the, it's considered the biggest success of the TTC, the, the export controls. Uh, I, I counted, I have to admit, uh, the, the previous statement from Paris, they mentioned Russia 56 times. In it, so it's a, a big uh, weighing factor on, on the agenda, and uh, the added value was evident uh, when the war broke out. You know, people on both sides of the Atlantic they knew whom to contact, how to start the uh, the sanctions, the controls very quickly, and it it it's just a, such a stark contrast to what happened to annexation of, of Crimea in 2014 when we were you know divided and confused. Uh, response was weak, took a long time, and so on, and so on. So yes, this this. Uh, I think this, this, this is also something that brought the, 
the two sides closer together and kind of unprecedented level of cooperation if you look at the previous president and what was happening then. And this will continue most likely. Mm -hmm. And and Kenneth, has, has that also been the feeling in, in the US? Yes, very much so. Um, I, I think that there has been quite an impressive level of, of transatlantic solidarity in this area. and. And um, the TTC has has contributed to it, um, even though, of course, the the real responsibility for export controls on the European side lies with with the member states and and not with uh, the EU institutions. But nevertheless, it's it's clear that the TTC was had a, a convening role um, in in pulling together um, the right experts and and getting them to work together closely and and quickly. Um, now, would this have happened even if the TCC didn't didn't exist? Of course, um, uh, although perhaps not so uh, efficiently as 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 it happened. Um, and and the the solidarity has extended beyond the U.S. and the EU. You know, there there's been strong multilateral cooperation uh, on export controls, even though there are some countries major countries that, that have not gone along. Um, historically, the dialogue in the export control area has been that the US leads um, aggressively, unilaterally, and, and, and Europe follows sometimes with, with questions about the, the ambition of the US measures. That, that dynamic has shifted uh, to some extent now. Uh, there seems to be uh, much more solidarity. Um, you know, that said, I think, uh, as, as Martin has mentioned, um, export controls over sensitive and emerging technologies um, is the next frontier, and, and that may be a harder one um, to, to, to make progress on. Um, but, but on the whole, I, I, I really do think this has been one of the, the success stories there. There's discussion now about um, collaborating on multilateral export control lists, on enforcement actions. And these are exactly the kind of uh, tangible work that I think the TTC is set up for. Mm -hmm. And this question is perhaps um, more towards Kenneth, since you're, you're, you have the US perspective, so to say. But of course, the Digital Service Act and the Digital Markets Act just entered into force in the European Union. And we know that the US has strongly criticized these, um, these regulations uh, for mostly affecting big tech companies, which are located in the US. What's your sense on, did this issue have any bearing in the last TTC meeting? Have these uh, concerns and this opposition um, diminished? Well, you're certainly right that it, as best one can tell, more or less dropped off the, um, the agenda at, at this most recent meeting. And I think that reflects the point that I made earlier, which is that the CCC is most useful when legislation has not been um, actually put in place yet. And, and so the passage uh, of those two uh, measures um, I think sort of put a, a punctuation mark um, in the discussion. Now there will be uh, continuing issues in this area. There's the important question of which companies are gonna be designated uh, as gatekeepers uh, under the legislation. There's a lot of important forthcoming work uh, from the commission, uh, which is just now getting itself organized um, on the subject. So I think, I think you can expect discrete elements uh, to, to continue to be part of the discussion between Washington and Brussels, um, certainly through ordinary diplomatic exchanges. And uh, I suppose it's conceivable that, that some elements could come back into the CCC as well. Mm -hmm. And throughout this discussion, you've, you've uh, both of you have, have mentioned that the DTC uh, perhaps um, makes cooperation faster or, or more uh, effective, but is not the end all uh, be all. And that perhaps um, it's 
it's a good forum before legislation is enacted and finalized. So I was wondering what's your outlook on whether the TTC has any potential uh, to become a permanent forum. Martin, what's your what's your outlook on this? Um, I think uh, looking, uh, you know, it's it's uh, first of all, yeah, there's always been this. Uh, uh, this this talk about TDC whether it should you know tackle the big problems or it should actually tackle new areas where we don't have these problems yet in order to avoid the problems and 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 I think it's it's definitely the the latter it's it it, it looks at the um, at the difficult to, topics that that you know that we can tackle together rather than looking at something in in the past um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, I think the, that there's been a, uh, created some sense of disappointment for the business community that was expecting that TTC will, uh, will take on uh, these big problems. And if you look at, for example, at the, the privacy issue, it's, it's been, um, it's, it's, I remember before the first TTC, there's been a, a, a big discussion whether this should be included or not. And I think the approach taken was not to have this, this kind of uh, symbolic big uh, Dividing, you know, problems within the TTC, but have it, let's say, boxed somewhere on the fringes and and, and dealt with by, by uh, on the margins. Uh, so at the same time, well, like I said, it creates a bit of a disappointment for the business. And 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 and, and if if the TTC, um, if there will be a let's say different president than Joe Biden and TTC is to survive uh, in a meaningful role, I think that has to change in the sense that the business should be. It's really crucial that it's from the American side that the business is on board and fully supportive for, for it to, to, to continue. And for you, Kenneth, do you see potential? Well, yes, um, with, with, with some qualifications. You know, I think the, the, the danger here is that if the outcomes from the particular meetings um, are, are very technical um, and in nature. And, and I think that's a, way, that's a way to describe what came out of this, this third meeting. Then, then there is a risk that the high level engagement of, of ministers will in the forum will, will wane. Um, and there already have been a few signs of this. Uh, Suggest you know, commission most notably, Commissioner Breton um, at the last minute canceled his participation because uh, the investment, the Inflation Reduction Act was not uh, part of the agenda. Um, and and similarly, there were there were rumors going around Washington about some of the U.S. principals balking at um, the the time commitment and didn't want to travel uh, outside of Washington. Um, for for the event, and you really need the high level political uh, impetus to to keep up momentum here. Um, otherwise, uh, the TTC will will devolve into um, a set of expert level conversations, which can be useful uh, at their own, on their own, but um, not necessarily part part of a greater whole. Um, so I think uh, that is. That is a, a, a concern that uh, we do have at the moment. You know, in in Washington, um, there's sentiment, particularly coming from business now, saying, "Well, well, why is it that that the IRA is is dominating the discussion? Why aren't we talking about uh, some of these measures?" I'm not talking about DMA or DSA here, but there are other pieces of digital legislation. That are um, in the works uh, in in the European Union that um, contain what the Commission likes to call sovereignty requirements, um, talking about um, certification schemes for for cloud uh, services for cloud service procurement by governments. This is a pretty low level initiative in the EU, but it does have potentially big consequences for for some companies. Um, uh, the Data Act uh, also has has sovereignty requirements in it that that are aimed at uh, preserving uh, the market for for European companies and excluding uh, foreign companies because they're subject uh, to foreign law. 
this is a, a topic area that has not yet come into the TCC. Uh, there's nothing about it in the most recent statement. Uh, but um, Commerce Secretary Raimondo, who's one of the U.S. principals in the negotiation, did say uh, during uh, one of the events at the TTC that uh, she thought there was a future for it to be discussed um, in this forum. So uh, I, I think this is um, rather a mixed picture at the moment. We've seen tangible progress in a few detailed regulatory areas. Uh, we see, you know, ambition to collaborate on a wide range of issues, but um, at the same time, um, there's a very clear awareness a year in that, that uh, this is not going to be the place where the U.S. and the EU talk about uh, the big uh, political issues between them, whether it's um, the data transfer agreement, as Marcin has mentioned, or um, the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. And I see that we have some questions from our audience. So we have uh, one participant who is wondering, what do other global powers uh, think of the establishing, establishment of the DTC? Do they see it as a threat or rather as something uh, symbolically? Uh, Marjorie, what's your, what's your sense on this so far? I think it depends which global powers you have in mind. Uh, I think there's always been this kind of uh, uh, you know, suspicion or criticism towards the TTC that if this is the, 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 I don't know how to call it, big boys talking or the EU and US, uh, you know, agreeing on something and trying to uh, to later to uh, impose it on, on, on the world or, or not not being inclusive, being just the, the Western allies to, and two of them. Uh, there's been a lot of calls also to include uh, like-minded countries like, like Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada. Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, I have to say it's, it, it seems to me pretty, maybe close is too strong a wall, but, but it, 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 it is a EU-US forum and, and, and uh, where you have these first signs of including more countries like these infrastructure agreements I was talking about with, with, uh, with Jamaica and Kenya. Uh, but I think for for the TTC to really make an impact, it it, it should somehow. I, I think maybe it's it's when you think of the football or soccer game, it's like the first half, you know, and maybe second half will be the um, reaching out to to more countries and trying to build some 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 global consensus. But I think it is so challenging to do it between the EU and US at the moment that that this is something still in the future. Yeah, in your reception so far from your side, there, there certainly is interest um, on the part of of other countries um, in in this type of discussion forum. You know, there was even um, uh, an announcement recently that that India was was interested in having a a similar um, set of set of discussions. Um, as as Marchin says. Um, there is sensitivity uh, about um, the sort of central core working out issues and then trying to generalize them uh, to the world. And so um, people are now starting to think about how to, to bring other partners uh, into the discussions. And it's, it's tricky architecturally when you have a body that is itself um, uh, you know, struggling to find a, a, a permanent foothold, and then you try to build out uh, architecture around that. But the concept, uh, which indeed originated in Brussels, uh, of, uh, of having a forum that's forward-looking, that's looking at discrete problems, that's not aiming at grand uh, free trade agreements, um, that that concept seems to uh, have found um, broader favor. A comment specifically on the EU India TTC. Um, and we have a participant who was uh, wondering if you think this will be uh, 
uh, similar or, or something different in terms of dealing with complex uh, global actors and whether this will be the area of soft law and, and international uh, economic law with, the, with these new, new councils? To be honest, yeah, that it, it reminds a bit of a. We don't have many details on this on this TTC with India. I mean, the, the name is is uh, kind of suggesting, you know, it's, it will be something similar. I, I have my doubts that it will ever have this kind of uh, you know scope or ambition. Uh, we had the announcement. I think it was in April that that they will start working on it, uh, and then this has been kind of. Uh, on the margin of also reviving the EU India talks on the free trade agreement, which these have been actually progressing now for some months, but I, I don't really, you know, that there's not much, there's not much detail apart from the this initial uh, initial um, statement that they start working on it. Um, yeah, I think you know maybe this is some some way forward to but to, to add more TTCs and then try to join them with the like-minded countries. You could have a TTC with Japan, with Korea. I don't know. It's. Uh, I, I am also waiting, you know, to be honest, to, to to see what comes out of the the Indian TTC. But but like I said, I I I don't think it would be even looking at the speed of which is it's moving, which is quite slow. Uh, I don't think it will be so uh, so comprehensive. You've you've already touched on. Uh, I don't know if it was just me that is having some internet uh, issues. Uh, Kenneth Martin? Yeah, I can hear you and, and see you, but you were blocked. Okay, I mean, so you were it's... you were paused. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I was just asking, Kenneth, you've already touched on on the EU India TTC, but um, what's your what's your outlook on, on this? What are the expectations uh, coming from from the US, who will not obviously take part? Um, but is the U U.S. also maybe looking to establish similar councils with with other countries? Um, well, I, I I I don't really have any light to shed on on what Brussels may have in mind with India and vice versa. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, the U.S. does have its own uh, parallel initiative going on in in, in the Indo Pacific. Uh, which launched um, uh, earlier this year. Um, it, it too will be in the realm of, of generating soft law uh, at best. Um, it's, to me, it looks like a fairly modest effort so far. Um, this is a US administration that is uh, fundamentally not interested in, in negotiating uh, new binding trade agreements, except perhaps in some very limited areas. And so um, I, I think the concept uh, that one sees in the TCC is, is going to be pursued um, more broadly by, by both Washington and Brussels. Mm -hmm. And I take the opportunity to ask uh, another uh, question uh, from, our, from our audience. Um, will we have one uh, participant who is uh, who has a question about green uh, industrial uh, subsidies of, as we've talked about the, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act and the dispute. So in this context, how can the US and the EU cooperate uh, on, on industrial uh, subsidies, specifically green uh, industrial subsidies? And what would be the forum for, for these discussions? Um, of course, we have the TTC, the WTO, the Global Arrangement on Sustainable Seal, still the USCD um, trade committee commitment committee um, so is there a risk that um, the pro proliferation of these initiatives will lead to strategic fragmentation a broad question but <laughs> Kenneth or Martin would you, would you like to take this I think they, they would like to know it the working group on the on, on the inflation election act would like to know the answer to this power because <laughs> <laughs> from, what we see so far, 
we see we see yeah i i i think it's 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 a very difficult question i mean the the what we see now is more of a i think a mutual not mutual maybe but there's a bit of fear anxiety of of uh, you know of of how the us subsidies what they mean for mean for europe uh and 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 um I don't know if, if fragmentation here really would play out because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a global good, uh, you know, the, the, the environment and and and, and climate change, uh, anti climate change actions. So so for for I, I don't see how this if you have the the, the green uh, revolution taking place simultaneously in you and the US, that's only better for the for the whole world. Uh, I don't. Don't see it, uh, how, how this could be um, negative in terms of fragmentation of, of these efforts. But yes, definitely the, the problem of how to coordinate these subsidies or how 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 not to because uh, you can imagine a situation when you know I don't know you attract so much uh, so much uh, investment, so many companies in the US that, that, that you have weaker innovation in Europe and so on. Uh, I think this 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 question is. Um, yeah, it is. It is. It, it, it's. 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 It's what a lot of people would like to know the answer to. <laughs> Maybe kind of. Yeah, you know, as for me, um, this this is going to be a really interesting one to to watch um, because there's there's history, of course, on subsidies. There's there's twenty years of um, dispute settlement proceed, proceedings between uh, Washington and Brussels over Airbus and, and Boeing subsidies. And, and now we seem to be tipping towards something similar in, in the green uh, technology area. Uh, you know, the US Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, um, made a public statement uh, when she was asked about the Inflation Reduction Act that, uh, well, maybe what the EU should be thinking about was its own subsidy programs. And, and um, uh, so, in other words, kind of an openness towards uh, towards um, subsidies on on both sides. The EU does have um, real limits on on the extent to which subsidies can be can be used um, through legislation, and so it will be interesting to see whether there's some some softening of that uh, with respect to to green technology or or other measures. It's it's a bit of an ironic situation. Because historically, the U.S. Um, accuses uh, the European Union of uh, its industrial policy, of state direction. Um, uh, but in this case, it, it was the U.S. that uh, sort of jumped first uh, with its own industrial uh, policy measures. So I, th I think we are we are moving away from from an era of um, Classical free trade and and the disciplines that the questioner referred to, and and towards um, an area in which there is going to be more state intervention. We are we are nearing uh, the end uh, of the webinar, but let's perhaps finish uh, with a, a question from from our audience. Um, and one of our participants says that the TTC has been criticized for being uh, unbalanced. And, and focusing too much on, on US interests. Um, is this uh, an accurate assessment? For example, Kenneth, uh, have you had a sense in, in the US of, uh, has there been criticisms on it being too focused on the EU or being favorable to, to the US? Or has it been a balance so far? What's been the perspective? Um, I, I, I've not heard that 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 criticism particularly. There there are always uh, people, particularly in the U.S. Congress, who 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 think that um, uh, paying this level of attention to to the European Union is um, is extreme. Um, that was a perspective, of course, that that was embodied most prominently in in the Trump administration. And uh, it remains an undercurrent in Washington. But uh, for the moment, we have 
an administration uh, that is really transatlanticist. Um, President Biden has spent a lot of his career working on foreign policy issues. A lot of that time with Europe, we're seeing some of the payoff uh, on that um, in in uh, the way the U.S. is handling Ukraine right now. So, um, no, for for the moment, I don't I don't think there's a perception that this is an unbalanced forum. And, and Martin, in, in the EU, has there been this perception of, uh, of unbalance, for example, in the European Parliament? Um, well, there's been a um, presentation of the outcome of the of the TTC to the International Trade Committee and, and, and the Parliament. And yes, uh, the Parliament has such a wide range of, of, of opinions, so that, that there is some there are some uh, some politicians, some um, MPs who who do actually raise these points that it is uh, you know. Uh, at the end, but it's also not not only the the MEPs, but I've also uh, read similar comments. Uh, I think it was from uh, Atlantic Council that you know if if, if we still if, if we still can't uh, really address the issues like the the the, 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 the Inflation Reduction Act, which which were actually um, conceived during the TT, so it was something that's a new new legislation that that is going to come. Uh, and it was not affected. Or on the other hand, if, if we cannot solve the big digital, uh, you know, uh, laws that come from the EU and and, 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 and affect the American companies uh, more than European ones, then what is the whole point of the TTC? So there's, uh, th I don't think it's it, it, it's um, it's skewed in any direction. But but I I've seen this has been an argument, um, for example, by some some members of Parliament. Um, but I am sure there are some who say that it's, uh, I cannot say that it's too, too pro-European. You always have the, this kind of discussions about something so complex. Thank you. And, and we will see uh, the, the next meeting will take place next year. So we will see how, how the TTC uh, progresses. But for now, I'd like to thank you. These were uh, very inter interesting uh, perspectives. And I'd also like to thank our audience members for uh, taking part uh, in the webinar. Um, if you'd like to know more about uh, the, the America Europe Fund, our upcoming events, or watch uh, recordings of past events, you can do so on our website, which is america-europefund.eu. So thank you uh, very much uh, for joining us today, and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.